The views and opinions expressed on America's Workforce Union podcast and its digital media channels are solely those of the speakers and do not necessarily represent the views and opinions of the producers or sponsors. Welcome to the America's Workforce Radio Podcast, the flagship production of the American Workers Radio and Podcast Network, where organized labor and its never-ending fight to protect the rights of the American worker come first. Now, presented by LIUNA, Laborers International Union of North America, here's your host, Ed Flash Ferens. A temporary workers' bill of rights upheld in the state of New Jersey. And today on the show, the Brotherhood of Maintenance of Way Employees and we check in with the president of Professional Aviation Safety Specialists. Welcome to the Thursday, August 1st edition of America's Workforce, where we're available on at least five platforms, including Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, iHeartRadio, Spotify, and Pandora. We have two guests on the show today. Tony Cardwell will be our featured guest. I love talking to Tony. Tony is general president of the Brotherhood of Maintenance of Way Employees, which is a division of the International Brotherhood of Teamsters. The Teamsters and the Brotherhood, both sponsors of America's Workforce, and the Brotherhood, well, this is the group of workers who build, who maintain the tracks, the bridges, the buildings, and other structures on the railroads of the United States. And every day, they're fighting for job security, better working conditions, fair wages, and benefits. Just what unions do. And today, first thing we're going to talk about, ever since East Palestine, Ohio happened, a lot of people are very concerned about rail safety, especially the communities. What are they carrying on those trains? Well, there's a piece of legislation that Tony's going to talk about. It's called the Railroad Safety Enhancement Act of 2024. And what it is, it's a stronger piece of legislation than a similar rail safety bill is in the Senate. And here's the problem. And you should be ready for this. You should know that this is probably going to happen anyway. When they talk about accidents and, oh, we're going to fix this, don't worry. Well, here comes the rail lobby, and they start watering it down. And that's what Tony's going to talk about. One of the big issues, and we've talked about this many times on the show, two-person crews, detectors, if there's something going wrong with the train that the engineer would know what's going on, uh, hazardous chemicals, you know, what do they have on the train? Do the first responders know if they're going through a respective community? A lot of these things, a lot of these things, very much of concern for the rail unions, including the Brotherhood of Maintenance of Way employees. We're also going to talk about high-speed rail. This is exploding in the state of California. Hopefully, it'll carry over to other states. Tony will check in on that as well. So he'll be our first guest. Later in the show, we're going to check in with David Spiro. Now, David is the national president of a great organization. They have 11,000 members, professional aviation safety specialists. These are the people that are behind the scenes. And uh, David, well, he's got a military background, and uh, he is very, very, he's been very vocal, especially on staffing. But first and foremost, we got some good news. They have moved forward with a tentative contract agreement for some of his members. He'll explain what that's going, where that is right now. And staffing. Now, staffing issues have caused a lot of problems. Ground stops flight delays. It's not just the air traffic controllers. Again, these are the people behind the scenes. Those are the ones that fix the equipment. They're all represented by professional aviation safety specialists. And there were two recent episodes in the city of Chicago, Chicago O'Hare Airport, and they were six weeks apart. Get this, a technician, a technician with the correct training and certification was not on duty to fix the equipment. Hello, where are you? Well, (laughs) that's where the staffing comes in, and uh, apparently the FAA is trying to hire more. It takes a while to train these technicians. David's going to talk about all of that as our second guest right here on America's Workforce. And now a brief look into the world of labor. This segment brought to you by Boyd Watterson Asset Management. You can find more at boydwatterson.com. The Third Circuit Court has upheld New Jersey's Temporary Workers' Bill of Rights. Now, that law 
includes a number of protections for temporary workers, including requirements that may be given the same compensation and benefits as full-time employees. How about that? Well, guess what? A coalition of staffing agency industry groups argued that the law was unconstitutional as a violation of the Dormant Commerce Clause. The court rejected the claim holding that the law did not favor in-state over out-of-state commerce and that any economic impacts of the law are incidental, as they put it, to its goal of creating consistency. Well, it's not over. Other challenges to the law still remain. The same industry groups have another pending suit alleging that the benefits portion of the law is preempted under ERISA. So stay tuned to this one. Time now for another segment of Labor 130. This is a special feature on America's workforce to promote the fact that we're coming up to the 130th anniversary of Labor Day. So between now and September 2nd, we are making an effort to highlight the people and the unions that got us where we are today. Well, you know, it did not come easy. By the way, this feature is presented by Blue Cross and Blue Shield's National Labor Office. We appreciate what they have done to make this happen. Well, let me go back to 1913. That year, the United Mine Workers of America went on strike against poor labor conditions at the Colorado Fuel and Iron Company. Well, in 1914, the Ludlow Massacre occurred. Bob Butero, a member of the Miners Union, spent the majority of his life as a historical auditor for the union, making sure we never forget the Ludlow Massacre. And this was in a previous episode of America's Workforce. Let's listen. On September 23rd of 1913, and there was over 10,000 coal miners that went on strike. Uh, they lived in company houses, so within days of them striking, the companies kicked them out of their houses. And so once they struck there, then the union itself uh, tried to, you know, set up what, whatever they could, and they set up tent colonies, and there was 10 tent colonies here in Los Animas County that housed these miners. And like I said, there was over 10,000 coal miners went on strike. Of course, the company, as we have the issues here, to, the same as we have today, they started bringing in scabs to replace these miners. Companies called in the, Paul, the Baldwin Phelps Detection Agency. They came out here, basically antagonized the striking miners. While the miners themselves, like I said, they, they built the these tent colonies and the unions uh, were paying them, I believe it was $3 a day to, to maintain the strike as a strike fund. Well, the strike continued on, and then around October, November of 1913, uh, the governor there, once the, the, the they called themselves the state militia or the state National Guard, they came in, and the National Guard took the, the, the company side in the strike. And the National Guard, it was shortly, they accused them of kidnapping some scabs and, and having them there. You know, that was never proven. There was never anything like that. Anyway, they opened fire on the tent colony. The state militia did. And at that time, the majority of the miners, you know, would... would do what they could to try to escape and get out. What happened was four women and 11 children crawled into uh, a cellar for protection because they thought that, you know, they were going to shoot and then that would be the, the, the size of it. Well, the, the state militia just opened fire, and when they thought that everybody had evacuated, they sent the tent colony on fire. Two of the women were able to crawl out of the cellar. Two women and 11 children died in that cellar on that day on, on April 20th. Uh, the gentleman that was running the strike, a gentleman by the name of Louis Tikus, uh, he was uh, basically assassinated that day. The miners, there was a shock that went through the whole, uh, not only a coal strike here, but nationwide. It, it grabbed nation attention. Shortly thereafter, these miners 
arm themselves and they attacked the militia and the and the coal companies they ran the the state militia out of the area and it was president uh woodrow wilson at that time that sent in federal troops and from that time the united mine workers in 1918 four years after that time they erected a monument and every year after that even before the monument was erected the umwa has held a service Remembering the Ludlow Massacre of 1914 by Bob Butero, member of the Miners Union, who spent a big chunk of his life as a historical auditor for the United Mine Workers of America. By the way, this segment is brought to you by Blue Cross and Blue Shield's National Labor Office. Blue Cross and Blue Shield companies formed out of a need to provide affordable health care to teachers, to loggers and miners and In 1965, the Blues developed the National Labor Office to strengthen its commitment to organized labor. Today, Blue Cross and Blue Shield's National Labor Office remains focused on America's workers, advocating for affordable and equitable health care, partnering with strategic alliances to provide industry-leading products and services, and proudly serving more than 18 million unionized workers, retirees, and their families, all working hard for America's working families and for the health of America. You can learn more by following them at Blue Labor on LinkedIn and X, formerly known as Twitter. All right, quick break. When we come back, Tony Cardwell, General President of the Brotherhood of Maintenance of Way Employees. This is America's Workforce. It takes Lyuna to keep America running. Over 70,000 public employees are part of Lyuna, the Laborers International Union of North America, delivering critical services such as health care and emergency response, as well as maintaining roads and sanitation systems. Even the National Postal Mail Handlers Union, representing over 47,000 U.S. postal workers, is affiliated with LIUNA. Find out what it takes for LIUNA to keep America running at LIUNA.org. That's L-I-U-N-A dot org. America's Workforce is brought to you in part by the United Steelworkers. You can find more at usw.org. We're the nurses, firefighters, and claims representatives that help keep our government services running. We respond to natural disasters. We care for our nation's veterans. And we investigate discrimination in the workplace. We are federal and D.C. government workers. And we are proud to serve the American people. Working in more than 70 agencies across the government, we know... We can fulfill our mission because our union has our back. Learn more at AFGE.org. Paid for by the American Federation of Government Employees, AFL-CIO. This segment of the show is brought to you by the Brotherhood of Maintenance of Way Employees Division of the International Brotherhood of Teamsters. For more information, please visit bmwe.org. America's Workforce is brought to you in part by the Iron Workers. You can find more at ironworkers.org. America's Workforce is brought to you in part by the International Brotherhood of Teamsters, where you can find more at teamster.org. Now, back to America's Workforce. Here's Ed Flash Ferens. And remember, you can check us out on Facebook or follow us on X, formerly known as Twitter. That would be AWF Union Podcast, AWF Union Podcast. By the way, this next segment brought to you in part by the United Labor Agency, ULAgency.org is your website. Let's go to line number one and welcome our featured guest today, and that would be Tony Cardwell, Tony, General President of the Brotherhood of Maintenance of Way Employees. He's had that position as general president since June of 2022. And as you know, especially since East Palestine, what happened there in February of 2023, rail safety is a premier issue in the halls of Congress. And what we're going to talk about right now is a piece of legislation that seems to be better than the bill that's in the Senate. This is the uh, Railroad Safety Enhancement Act of 2024, which has the support of the Brotherhood of Maintenance of Way employees, which, by the way, is a division of the International Brotherhood of Teamsters. Tony, welcome back to uh, America's Workforce. Thanks for uh, joining us on the show today. And uh, I'll tell you, we got to get something done here because I know train derailments, they happen every day. They don't get the publicity of what happened in East Palestine, Ohio. That was a horrific accident. But you know what? There's accidents waiting to happen right now as we speak. So talk to me 
about uh, about this legislation and how it's different from what's going on in the Senate. Go ahead, my brother. Yeah, I mean, there's there's so much to it and so much more different as we're working through the uh, rail safety bill, which is still be in progress. And it was actually supposed to get a vote last week. Uh, we're hopeful that it was going to. We're hearing that it might be brought up, but it, it, uh, it got uh, they actually moved for getting a bill on, uh, I think, the child tax credit over this one. Um, and so it didn't. Um, the rail enhancement bill is obviously something we support more from a labor standpoint because it's uh, got the restrictions we actually need. As you know, some of these bills go through uh, they go through Congress and and they in the Senate and they get watered down. They get uh, amended and changed and they get things taken out of it. And um, the enhancement bill, obviously. Uh, is what we know needs to happen in rail labor to set up the railroads uh, in, in, and put safety in the forefront to to force them to operate safer in the towns and communities around you. And so the the bill it's the uh, the the list that needs to be taken care of to the watered down list. Now we'll support we support 100 percent behind the rail safety bill because any change. Uh, in, in rail safety is good change. Any, any improvements in rail safety is good improvements. Um, but one obviously is the uh, watered down uh, version that's accepted and, and amended and changed uh, by the Senate. And the other one is uh, uh, one that we definitely uh, want, uh, that we definitely want, we believe is, is where we need to be, if that makes sense. Well, let, let's tear this apart a little bit, if you don't mind. Uh, I want to I want to find out what they're trying to water down or what they have watered down, and I want to know what's making uh, the Rail Safety Enhancement Act better. So let's start with the watering down part. What, what have they taken out of that uh, the bill that they're talking about in the Senate? So you're always trying to have. They're always trying to take out and remove. Uh, you know, the two man crew issue. And that's obviously a big one, right? Um, we got to make sure that we have two individuals operating these, you know, several mile long trains. And and the carriers are always trying to get to a point to where they only have one. So that fight's constant. Uh, but there's a lot of nuanced stuff. And that's based on, the way, of course, we believe that there should be the train size that there is, nearly three mile trains these days, the, the, the fact that they have these these trains that are double and triple longer than they've ever been, we believe is dangerous, particularly uh, when there's an immense amount of chemicals on those trains. And so we're trying to make sure that trains remain a, a safe size to go through communities. And this is for multiple reasons. Train size and train, train length is important because when you have have to operate around railroad crossings and you have to get ambulances and fire trucks and in your community, you shouldn't have to wait for 45 minutes at a train crossing. And you and so train size is important for the communities. I want to speak to just the American people. You all sat at a, at a railroad crossing before, and that's fine because that train going in front of you is carrying all kinds of important stuff that need to get to the, uh, you know, to your township, to the chemicals for that clear your clear your water and keep your water clean. There's there's all kinds of things, the lumber that builds houses, the steel that you build buildings with, and on and on and so forth. So that stuff's important. Uh, there's no doubt about it. But the fact that you have to sit there twice or three times as long as you used to have to sit at that train crossing is ridiculous. So you want an appropriate train size, right? That's an important issue. Roadside detectors, you want to make sure you have the appropriate amount of detectors that detect things like hot wheels. And you, you want to make sure that you have the appropriate detectors that pick up dragging equipment and stuff so it stops these derailments. That's an important thing to have. And, and the carriers are always trying to not or be required to have less detectors on the track so that these, you know, they're further apart. So there's a longer distance between two detectors and this is what causes, you know, that what causes the derailment was a heated wheel. So they don't want to force these, uh, force themselves to have to spend money on more detectors and maintain those detectors and whatnot. It, it, there's so many things we could sit here for two hours and talk about. But those are just a couple big ones to think about for the general public. And then one of the probably most important is how many chemical cars should you be allowed to carry on that train and how close should they be together? In other words, should you be able to carry, you know, a whole train of chlorine, 
or should it be a limited amount um, on each train so that you're not, uh, you, you know, it's not it's something comparable to a bomb going off like, like East Palestine. Should we try to prevent the amount of chemicals and how close those cars are together? So if there is a derailment in the middle of a train, you know, should it be, where should the cars be placed? And I don't know all the details because I'm not a carman and I'm not a specialist in that, but there's there, the specialists have spoken and said what should be in there. And, and and that these are things that we're trying to push in, in the bill. And so all these things matter and they're important. And what you get is you get the railroad lobbyist in there. We said they're going to work with us on rail safety and really are going to support. And they watered down a bunch of things that they said they were going to support in the bill. But obviously they get their, you know, their lobbyist in there and they, and they have just enough money paid to it, just enough politicians to make sure that they get what they want so they can operate and continue to operate with impunity on a lot of these things that are, are dangerous to the communities and that's that's what we're concerned about um the bill's good we're going to support we're going to support the rail safety bill we have i've signed my name to it because like i said any improvements are good for the general public um but obviously it's it's been watered down so that's where we're at that's i i see it you know one other issue too is uh the communities when you, you mentioned these hazardous chemicals and you just don't know and look what happened in east palestine that was a good example there what about the communities being warned ahead of time if they're going to bring those chemicals through and and they're going to go through a, a you know, pretty pretty well populated town Will they know about it? Is, is, is anybody talking about maybe advance warning as far as, hey, we're bringing, we're coming through your town, just let, let just letting you know. Is that being discussed in Congress at all? Obviously, there's not the amount of knowledge that the general public should know. And this is a big deal in East Palestine. The NTSB reports indicate that the NS Railroad, the Norfolk Southern Railroad, was actually not only did the, did the public not know, and it was very difficult for them to get access, so the first responders didn't know the chemicals they were dealing with, right? Right. That, that were in East Palestine. But one of the big issues is is that they're um, is is that they're they're you know being uncooperative about this. In in after East Palestine, they lied. So this is what's crazy: is the NTSB report indicates that they weren't forthright and honest about things. Not just little things, important things. And so the NTSB report, and I respect Director Hammond's uh, report because she actually did the deep dive into this to really find out what the problems were and what were, was going on. And I think that report should be alarming to a lot of people. I think it should uh, wake, uh, if, if people take the time just to understand or look at that report, they're, they're, they're going to find that these uh, railroads have a responsibility to make sure that the general public knows right away and that they are keeping track of the stuff and that they're being honest with the general public when there's a derailment like this and all of those those mechanisms failed or the system failed miserably after east palestine and that's what the ntsb report says that's not my opinion that's what it says after the review was done that there was a bunch of dishonesty and untruth about what was there how much how much of it uh you know it was reported that the chemicals were getting extremely hot and the report shows that that's not what happened and that's why they burnt off and that's why the big bomb looking thing would happen and so there's a lot of craziness and confusion and dishonesty that went on there so yeah these these bills need to hold their feet to the fire to make sure that the carriers are uh there's either something accessible for first responders so they know what they're dealing with and there's, you know, a level of honesty there and a level of truth there because, I mean, you, God only knows you want to know what chemicals you're dealing with when they're spilling out of the train. Uh, a recent incident just happened, or it, ju it just happened again. Fortunately, um, it was a very small community and there wasn't a lot of population in the area, but you had a North Dakota derailment in which a, a huge amounts of pneumonia were spilled. And, and you hardly heard about it. In fact, most of your listeners probably don't even know that it happened. And there was a huge amount of chemical spill. And once again, they sent our members into this, into this work location without all the proper PP and training and whatnot. And our guys were exposed to chemicals again. And this is, you know, in light of East Palestine, they didn't learn a whole lot. The CP Railroad, Canadian Pacific Railroad, uh, sent 
guys in and into a chemical spill that were not trained, things weren't handled right again. So these railroads refused to, you know, fix themselves. They they refused to adopt and you know change policies that fix themselves in light of these Palestine. They have to be regulated, and these bills are important to force them to regulate, you know, to, to regulate the way they should. We can't trust them to regulate themselves. That's just never going to happen. No, not at all. Uh, one more question here before we break. This being a politically charged year, and you know what's going on. I'm not, I'm not going to get into the details on that. I have to ask you, Tony, will anything get done on this? I mean, I mean, uh, East Palestine happened February. Oh, it's going to be two years this coming February 2025. Are we going to see any action on these uh, on these bills? We were very hopeful. We were hopeful that the, it, it was a bipartisan bill, and you had Brown and Vance, and you know, obviously everyone knows who Vance is. And so we were hopeful that the bill would get get there. We were hopeful that it would pass. But um, you know, I'm not going to accuse. I don't know why it didn't get voted on. I mean, there's obviously lots of important things going on that are being voted on, and so I I, I respect you know Schumer's choice on. What what has moved through and what's voted on uh, on the Senate, but uh, we're hopeful. Um, you know, now they're out of session here coming up real soon. I think either I think they last week or this week is in last week there for a while, and so we're hopeful that they uh, we're hopeful that they move it through in the next session, and we're, we're going to keep pushing. Uh, the further we get away from East Palestine, the the more fearful I get that it's just going to get forgotten. I hear you. This isn't just an issue for us. This yeah. is an issue for the people of Palestine. They've been ignored and, and they've been, you know, this is important for them. This is to bring a remedy, some remedy to the issue that they're suffering from. And I'm sure those people want enough respect to get these things taken care of to make sure it happens to no one else. And so I'm hopeful. Well, Tony, we're going to keep it alive here on America's Workforce. Trust me on that one, all right? Great. Tony Cardwell joining us on our live line today is General President of the Brotherhood of Maintenance of Way Employees, which is a division of the International Brotherhood of Teamsters, BMWE.org. We'll continue with Tony later in the show. We're going to check in with David Spiro. David is President of the Professional Aviation Safety Specialists. And these are the people behind the scenes. And guess what? They have a staffing problem. We'll talk about that and more back in a few minutes. Don't go away. You're listening to America's Workforce with Ed Flash Ferrans. It takes Lyuna to power North America with affordable energy. The men and women of Lyuna, the Laborers International Union of North America, have the skills needed to build and maintain oil, natural gas, nuclear, solar, and wind projects that are shaping America's energy future. From new energy tech to retrofitted facilities, Lyuna members do it all. Find out what it takes to be powered by Lyuna at Lyuna.org. That's L-I-U-N-A dot org. America's Workforce is brought to you in part by the Communication Workers of America. You can find more at cwa-union.org. There is unity and strength for workers. We are the USW. We are the USW. The The United United Steel Steel Workers. Workers. The largest industrial union in North America. We represent 850,000 members in In the the US, US, Canada, and and the the Caribbean. Caribbean. We work in metals, rubber, chemicals, paper, oil refining, atomic energy, and the service sector. We are steel workers, standing strong and fighting for what's right. America's Workforce is brought to you in part by the International Federation of Professional and Technical Engineers. You can find more at ifpte.org. Attention members of the Heat and Frost Insulators Union who are interested in traveling. Central Ohio has more construction projects on the books than anywhere in the U.S. Mega projects, large and medium-sized jobs are creating more work than our local 50 brothers and sisters can handle. Projects like Intel, the Honda LG battery plant, and multiple data centers for Facebook, Google, and Amazon offer union wages, overtime, and exciting incentives. Local 50 is seeking union travelers to meet the needs of its signatory contractors who can put you to work immediately. If you're a member in good standing and interested in the work opportunities in Central Ohio, visit insulators50.com forward slash AWF travel for more information. Now, back 
to Ed Flash Ferrens with America's Workforce. And remember, you can check us out on at least five platforms. That includes Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, iHeartRadio, Spotify, and Pandora. And when you get an opportunity, here's what you do. Just sign up and receive our shows on a regular basis and give us a rating. We always appreciate those five-star ratings, so please keep them coming. Let's go back to our live line. Rejoin Tony Cardwell. General President of the Brotherhood of Maintenance of Way Employees, BMWE.org. Tony, I want to talk about high-speed rail. In fact, I got an update from uh, Greg Regan. You know Greg, who handles the uh, Transportation Trades Department of the uh, AFL-CIO. TTD.org is their website. He's been keeping us apprised of what's going on, especially in the state of California. And I know, uh, I know your members are pretty excited about this. I'd like to get your perspective because uh, I tell you, this country is way behind when it comes to uh, high-speed rail. And I, I guess there's a lot of push. Again, it's it's the politics involved. They, I, 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 they, I, people rather drive their cars. They'd rather fly in the planes. But uh, when it comes to high-speed rail, it just is. It's not sticking. So what's going on in the state of California, and how did that happen? Go ahead. Yeah, the state of California um, on on the high speed rail there, we're still pushing forward, and it is going to it is going to be built. They're doing a great job of of, of they have most of the infrastructure in pl- place already. Um, they it's just simply getting you know they're still finalizing you know details. They're still building, and it's going on. Uh, but the one that will be uh, in place and and is our, they've already broken ground on. And they're trying to they're going to try to complete it before the uh, 2028 Olympics in L.A. And that's the Bright Line project going between um, San, uh, Las Vegas and, and, uh, and uh, L.A. And that project is is taking off and it is getting, you know, there's a lot of private investment in that as well. It's going to succeed and it's and it's it's going to be an operation um, before California high speed rail. Uh, and and I believe this is something to get excited about. The ground, you know, we I was at the groundbreaking ceremony a couple months ago, and they are breaking ground and they are moving forward with that project. Um, and it's exciting because once you know, once people get on these trains and they realize how fast you can get from one town to another, and you know, the the private money will be flowing. It's an exciting. Uh, Anyone that's ridden high-speed rail knows how good of transportation it is and how much it's needed in the United States to decongest the roads between, you know, two major cities like Las Vegas and L.A. If you've driven those roads before across, you know, eastern California there and and, uh, across the desert, you know how bad those trips can be with the traffic and everything else involved. And so you it's going to be nice to be able to get on that train and get between the two cities in a couple of hours. And that's what you'll be able to do. Uh, and they're looking at other cities like that. So they have a bunch of other you know, projects that they're uh, prospecting right now. And, and, and I think that this uh, project will um, really show America what we can do. And so I think the completion of these projects in the first high-speed rail they're really going to open up everyone's eyes uh, to the importance of having it everywhere. And once people ride it, they're going to want it in cities near them. And so um, I think we're on the precipice of a, of a real takeoff. And, and so we just got to get over some humps. And there is people that are negative towards it. Um, the, railroad, the, the, the freight railroads themselves seem to be very um, negative towards it. I don't think they want any form of competition they've been a duopoly for years and they want to keep it that way and so i don't think they want competition with any other form of rail and um you know and that's going to provide a bunch of jobs in the industry too so it's going to be more competitive and uh, so i think it's going to take off i don't just think i think there's a lot of very very uh, much smarter people than me that believe that this is going to uh, really take off in america once the first one's established Tony, uh, I'd like to talk about the number of jobs that might be created here. And the Brotherhood, your union, the Brotherhood of Maintenance of Way Employees, builds and maintains those tracks. Are we talking about new tracks? You mentioned the freight the freight rail, and I don't know if we're going to use those tracks. Uh, what, what do we know about this right now? Because I see some tremendous opportunity here. Some of it's new tracks and new areas, right? And some of it goes along, uh, will be uh, on on some of the freight tracks. So the high-speed portion of them will be new tracks because it's going to be built at a different 
standard and, and maintained it a different standard. But a lot of these operational are on right-of-ways of old tracks that are in place or they're along the highways. So, for example, the one being built in um, the one being built uh, um, that we were just talking about, the Brightline project between Las Vegas and LA, that one's going to be, a lot of it's going to be built in between uh, the roadway. So in between the two highway in the middle of it. And, and uh, that that's where most of that project is going to be. But uh, some of it, you know, th to get downtown LA is going to be on the track systems that are already in place. And uh, the, the freights don't like it because it creates, you know, one, if it really takes off, it creates thousands of railroad jobs and it makes that market more competitive, right? And higher demand for like people in my craft, which is the, the maintenance away, a lot of skilled labor workers that do the work. Um, it's going to create, you know, thousands of new jobs within the industry and it makes it more competitive for wage. And so if I don't like one of the freight railroads and I say, okay, you know, you aren't treating me right. I have the opportunity to go work, take my skill set, and go work on, on these high speed rails. And so we think it's going to create more competition within the market for for labor, and that's a good thing because uh, the the freights are going to realize that you know they've been taking advantage of our workers for many many years, and they're going to have to you know pay the prices that are, that it demands. So we're excited for that. Tony, what kind of speed are we talking about on these uh, on these uh, high speed rails? Is it going to be like I mean, some of them I know go over two hundred miles an hour. Are we going to be in that ballpark? Yeah, just over two hundred. The one, the high speed rail California. I think they project that they're going to get up to us uh, just over two hundred miles an hour. I think the one, um, I think the one between uh, the Brightline project between Vegas and, and L.A. Uh, don't quote me on this, but I know it's between one hundred. 180 and 200 miles an hour in that you know, stretch. And so I think it depends on the type of train you're using, you know, and all that stuff. And obviously it depends on grade and crossings and stuff in the area. So, um, you know, I think they're going to be somewhere between 180 and 210 miles an hour. That's pretty fast. That, that works for me. I like that. Okay. Let me ask you this and I'll let you go. I know you're pretty busy. Um, I'm sure a lot of people are watching and and hearing a whole lot about what's going on out west. It's called, I guess, Bright Line West. I know you were at the groundbreaking. Just wondering, just wondering, are other states thinking, well, this might be a good idea in my state? I might be a little far ahead on this one, but you got your ear to the ground. What are you hearing right now? The states are really looking at this. So let's just take Texas, for example. Uh, anyone that's ever traveled, all of your Texas listeners or, or people that have traveled in the Houston to Dallas area, they know what you've got to go through. I've driven it several times when I worked down in that area or I've gone down and done negotiating in that area. I've traveled those roads before and they get extremely congested. And there's, you know, thousands and thousands of people on the roadways that can take hours upon hours between those two cities. And ultimately, um, Texas is looking at a high-speed rail in between uh, that does, I believe, Texas uh, to to um, um, Dallas, Fort Worth, um, and it actually does a kind of a U. I think it, it goes to one of the other major cities in Texas, and so they're looking at that as an option. And I think it's become a viable option. There's pushback from the communities. Obviously, you've got to find land to to, to build these, and so there's there's pushback uh, from some of the farmers and whatnot in that, you know, in that state to not allow it. Uh, but ultimately it looks like it's catching you know, some traction and there's uh, been some approvals and they're continuing to work for that. Um, but, you know, you're talking about cutting the trip that w which would take you to drive in more than half by being able to get on a train. You don't have to go ch through security in an airport and check your luggage and do these different things. Um, you actually can just, you know, walk through the gates at, a, at your high-speed rail center and location and get on your train and, and across that, that you know, to the next town you go. So the focus, I think, for the high-speed rail investors is in between these cities where they're really too close to fly. And it's, it's, it's an obstacle to go to an airport and wait for two hours and get on a plane and go through security and all that and lines and everything else. And, and it's not worth that time for that half an hour to an hour flight, right? And so they're looking for these locations where cities are closer together. There's a lot of congestion on the roads. And really, air travel is not the best option 
Um, so the high speed rail is the best option. And that's what they're focused on to start with. And I think that's going to expand into, you know, more uh, nationally uh, high speed rail. But these are the type of cities you're looking at it. So you're looking at da- uh, Nashville as another example. They're looking at Nashville. Uh, to um, all the way down to Atlanta, where it's extremely congested through the Chattanooga area and all that. And they're looking at these different areas and towns like this to where they're fairly close together, but they're far enough apart that it's a pain to drive and it's not the best option to fly. And so that's that's what we're primarily focused on. And so uh, there's a lot of prospects out there and there's a lot of people trying to get approvals and stuff. And so there's a lot of locations that I, we believe that they're going to be successful in getting it going. Um, yeah, it's coming. And Tony, the bottom line on all that, that's great news for the Brotherhood of Maintenance of Way employees, especially if America goes in that direction. So you keep up the fight, keep in touch with us. Thanks for the time here on America's Workforce and thanks for the sponsorship. Okay, my brother. Thank you. And you guys do great work. And I always love being on and I love listening to your podcast. And uh, I see that you guys are growing. So we're excited for you. Tony Cardwell, General President of the Brotherhood of Maintenance of Way Employees, BMWE.org. Quick break. David Spiro with the Professional Aviation Safety Specialist coming up next. This is America's Workforce. America's Workforce appreciates our sponsor, the Columbus Central Ohio Building and Construction Trades Council, who represents more than 18,000 workers from 19 affiliated local unions and district councils. America's Workforce is brought to you in part by the Heat and Frost Insulators Labor Management Cooperative Trust. Find out more at insulators.org forward slash LMCT. America's Workforce is sponsored in part by Boyd Watterson Asset Management, LLC. Find out more about our investment solutions tailored to meet the needs of Taft-Hartley funds at BoydWatterson.com. America's Workforce Radio is sponsored in part by the International Union of Painters and Allied Trades, District Council 6, representing painters, glazers, drywall finishers, and sign and display industry workers. They remind you that belonging to a union is your right as an American. This portion of the show brought to you by the International Union of Bricklayers and Allied Craft Workers. For more information, please visit BACWeb.org. It takes Layuna to keep America running. Over 70,000 public employees are part of Layuna, the Laborers International Union of North America, delivering critical services such as health care and emergency response, as well as maintaining roads and sanitation systems. Even the National Postal Mail Handlers Union, representing over 47,000 U.S. postal workers, is affiliated with Layuna. Find out what it takes for Layuna to keep America running at Layuna.org. That's L-I-U-N-A dot org. This is America's Workforce. More shows available at awfradio.com. And remember, you can check us out on Facebook or follow us on X, formerly known as Twitter. That would be AWF Union Podcast. AWF Union Podcast. Let's go to line number two and check in with David Spiro. David is the president of the Professional Aviation Safety Specialists and PassNational.org is their website. David has been president for a number of years, and we're talking about 11,000 employees for PASS. And uh, we got some staffing issues we're going to talk about. But first, we have a tentative agreement for uh, aviation safety inspectors. I always like to start off with some good news. So, David, talk to me about this. I, I know <laughs> I know one thing. It's never easy. So uh, where do we stand with this, and how did we get to where we are today? Go ahead. Hi, Flash. Thanks for having me on. Um, yeah, we've been in bargaining for two and a half years now with the agency, almost two and a half years with the agency uh, over our aviation safety inspectors. And, and uh, those are the folks that that uh, oversee every aspect of the aviation industry and they ensure adherence, adherence to uh, all the regulations and safety standards. They develop policy, investigate accidents and all that sort of stuff. Pretty important job. We finally came to an agreement uh, with the agency uh, just a few weeks ago, and we started rolling it out yesterday to uh, to our members, explaining some of the provisions of the contract. But it wasn't easy. We we wound up going to uh, to mediation back in July, in June and July. We spent some time in mediation, had to bring in some professionals to, to guide us through that process, and and eventually we came up with an agreement and and. 
Uh, you know, it's out right now. It's a membership. We're educating them on, on what the provisions are. But uh, there's some there's some financial uh, there's some financial gains there. There's bonuses for all the employees. Uh, there's a, a, in, in the government you accrue sick leave over time. So there's a there's a buyback provision on sick leave uh, at the end of your career if you want to want to if you want to uh, uh, have that sick leave provided to you in a in a cash uh, payout. Uh, there's recruitment incentives and uh, uh, on-the-job training and, and a variety of other things. And we're putting it out there now for our members to uh, be educated on. And uh, we'll start the ratification vote here in about uh, about three weeks. Well, David, that hard work is paying off, no doubt about that. But I understand you're still bargaining for the employees in, uh, in air traffic. Can you explain uh, where we are with that right now? Yeah, so we represent employees in the air traffic organization, system specialists uh, that and ensure the functionality of the systems. Aeronautical information specialists, they, they do flight procedures, a variety of aviation products, uh, mission support, uh, a ton of folks in, in the organization uh, that are not air traffic controllers, let's, let's put it that way. That one is, uh, that one's taking some more time. We've got issues over there. Uh, we're trying to we're trying to get the pay system there uh, a bit more equitable. Over the last 25 years, since the FAA went away from the old government general schedule system. Uh, we've had a, a pay system there that's been disparate, um, and we've been bargaining with them now for we're, we're we're starting to get on about a year and a half with with them. We're about a year behind on the from the other contract. And uh, we're we're still we're still plugging along. Our folks are bargaining this week. Uh, now that we're not doing two contracts at once, it might be a little easier to to get to the table with them all the time. But we're we've been ready to exchange proposals uh, every day, all day uh, with them. And and we have stepped up the game. We have brought in uh, someone to help facilitate our meetings. That's a, a professional that I think is is uh, adding value to it. And we are moving along. We don't have uh, we don't have a ton of articles left in the contract to do, but uh, there's some heavy lifts, including pay, as I said. So uh, that, that's been a, a pretty big deal for us uh, for a while now. And that one, once we close that one out and get what we're looking for, I, I think we can uh, move forward. And I think we could do a lot of really good things with the agency, uh, given some of the provisions that we're asking for in that contract. David, uh, just to be clear to our listeners right now, you talked about the employees in the air traffic uh, division. We're not talking air traffic controllers. These are the people behind the scenes. They're, they're the ones that are servicing the equipment to make sure that everything is safe, especially for air travel. Can you elaborate on that a little bit more? Sure, I can, Flash. So the, the, uh, of the 7,000 or so employees we represent in, uh, in the air traffic organization in, in FAA, a large portion of them are uh, system specialists. They ensure that, make sure that the uh, communication systems, computers, navigational aids, power systems that air traffic controllers use uh, that's vital to air travel and the mission of pilots and, 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 uh, and uh, obviously the safety of the flying public is working. We, we repair that. We certify it. We make sure that all that equipment is, is running in accordance with the uh, with the parameters that are set forth. So you're talking about radars and, and uh, those, when, when you're flying in and you see all those flashing lights, we make sure all that stuff works. Uh, those, those beautiful, pretty lights that are, that are flashing in a long row. That's, that's the kind of stuff that our folks take care of. And uh, you know, we're behind the scenes. It's sort of, it's sort of like uh, the, the engineering portion of the Starship Enterprise, you know, we're, we're, we're down there, we're down there making sure all that stuff works, but nobody sees us. Uh huh. Uh, I like that analogy. That's a good one. I, I did love Star Trek, by the way. Anyway, uh, the staffing issue is this where the is this where the staffing issues are? And I was reading about some incidents here. One in Chicago here, and, and you know, I <laughs> I don't want to scare our listeners, but I mean, they have to know what's going on behind the scenes, and that's where you come in behind the scenes. Talk to me about what's going on here. Yeah, so uh, you know, it's funny you bring that up because uh, I, I was recently testifying in front of the House Transportation Infrastructure uh, uh, Committee, the Aviation Subcommittee, and uh, uh, Representative Garcia from Illinois asked me about a ground stop in Chicago that happened back in June, and uh, I had to explain to him that the, the 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 reason that it happened is a, a radar was malfunctioning. So I'll go back to that that Starship Enterprise again. You know the the 
the uh, the bridge where Captain Kirk is and, and, and all those folks, all that area right there is we, that's an operations center for us. And uh, all the all that information that's being fed in, all the radars in, are, that are uh, in the Illinois area that are making sure that they the controllers can control traffic in a, in a large area. That one of those radars wasn't working right. And uh, we sent folks out there to, to fix it, but you had to exclude that from, from what was feeding in. And because no one was on shift at the time, we didn't have a technician because of staffing and training issues. We didn't have a technician that was available to exclude that. You've got to get into the system. You have to have access to it. You have to have to be certified, understand the software. You don't want to be messing around with that sort of thing if you don't know what you're doing. Right. And uh, because they were getting multiple targets on on the display the controllers didn't know where the airplanes were so they had to say hold on we're, we we got to keep everybody on the ground until we get this thing fixed so they had a ground stop at o'hare and you know if you've ever flown into chicago and uh and suddenly all the airplanes stop moving uh delays start to back up pretty quickly and you know that, and again, we had a we had a similar problem that happened uh, just a few weeks ago in in Chicago O'Hare because we didn't have enough folks available uh, to repair uh, a radar in in Chicago that was that was uh, um, showing where the ground movement was of the airplanes in that area. So now I'll give the agency credit; they've got a plan for next year to hire about twice as many as they normally hire, but at the same time. Uh, you know, this is a this is a serious issue, and our folks out there are out there right now uh, w- without uh, without people behind them and, and uh, having enough people on shift uh, to to cover the, the problems that they have. And we've asked that the agency create a, a workforce plan for these folks to the, to make sure that they plan for attrition and, and future deployment, air traffic control modernization, and emerging technologies and and they're starting to do that, but I've been harping about it for three years now, and it's starting to happen. And we're moving, again, I've said this before, we're moving at the speed of government, but but um, it, you know, it's not it's not happening quick enough for us. But it'll, I'm hopeful it'll happen, and I'm trying to get Congress to to uh, at the same time support us in those endeavors. And David, let me ask you this. How long does it take to train these technicians behind the scenes? I mean, you can't just hire somebody and say, hey, here's day one, get to it. How long does it take? Oh, it's a real good question. So it could take three to five years to, to, to get somebody uh, up to speed. And have the, and they got to come in with the, with the requisite skills. You have to have some uh, understanding of electronics. A lot of these folks come uh, from from the military they've got experience working uh, working on radar and navigational aids and, and and other sorts of avionic systems in the military but then it's a whole new world you're you're, you're working at an airport uh you've got to you've got to be trained on the systems that the faa has there's got to be training slots you have to get on the on the job training and the problem with it is they've for a long time had this punch out, punch in mentality. They don't hire someone until someone retires, and and, and that uh, if they're not planning for attrition, well, then somebody with thirty five or forty years, they retire, they walk out the door, all that knowledge is lost. That they, they they're not able to mentor that person coming in behind them, and so that when they leave, they can step into their shoes. What we have is a situation where if somebody leaves, another person that a journeyman that's left there has to pick up their work. And train the new person coming in behind them, and that that is not a, a sustainable model. And the, I, I do believe now the agency knows that and realizes that, and uh, we're we're working we're, they're, they're working to try to resolve that. But we want more involvement in that process. And that's where the union comes in. Well, congratulations on that testimony. We'll see what happens here, David Spiro who is the president of Professional Aviation Safety Specialists. We're talking 11,000 strong. Do check out their national website. That story that he talked about in Chicago is posted there, passnational.org, passnational.org. David, you take care. Please keep in touch with us. Okay, brother? Thanks, Flash. Always nice to talk to you. And that'll be it for another edition of America's Workforce. Coming up tomorrow, we're going to check in with the Central Ohio Building Trades, and it's our first Friday with Fred, Fred Redman, Secretary-Treasurer of the AFL-CIO. Until then, all of you have a safe and wonderful day. 
That concludes another episode of the America's Workforce Radio Podcast. Thanks for listening, and be sure to subscribe so you never miss a show. America's Workforce is a production of Labor Tools and BMA Media Group. Find out more information online at labortools.com. 